رحمة مودة مودة means love not sexual love as such it's much more than that a certain tenderness to it affectionate love so this is the purpose why a man and a woman get married to create an atmosphere that is charged by feelings of rahma, mercy, and feelings of mawadda, affection or affectionate love. So ideally, Islam uh, envisions cooperation and complementarity. And it's not the Islamic position at all that rule belongs to the man in the house and the woman is not at all to be consulted and her opinion does not matter at all. This is not the Islamic view. Ideally, there should be cooperation. And there are moral injunctions. And there's the prophetic precedent. The prophet said, I am the best of you, and I never beat my wives. The prophet never beat uh, even a slave, anyone. All right, so this is the purpose then. But there are certain situations where a decision has to be taken. And if you take, again, the larger context, um, Islam holds that the man should be in that position. This, again, does not mean that the man can lord it over uh, the rest of the family. However, in one situation, note the word nushus. There is um, this expression, you may beat them. Note the word nushuz. Um, nushuz in Arabic literally means to rise up. If, uh, if, if um, uh, an animal is sitting down, it rises up, a chicken or rooster, some, that's the act of rising up, or an animal sitting down on the ground rises up. Just as in English, from rising, we have the word uprising in the sense of revolt. Likewise, in Arabic, from the same act of uh, getting up from the ground in a physical sense, rising, it really means something like uprising. If a woman um, stages an uprising and acts in such a way that um, her act constitutes within the realm of the house, a revolt, so that the man's man authority is severely challenged, <coughs> then a series of prescriptions. The first is um, um, admonish them, that is, advise them, refuse to share their beds, and last, beat them lightly. Lightly, of course, is an addition here, but just as Hadith explains, I'll, I'll have, I have a few more points to make about this. Uh, but a little later. Just as uh, uh, the hadith, hadith explains the Quran, we know that. There's a hadith which says, if at all you lift a hand and should beat your wife, it must be ghair mubarrih. That is, it must leave no marks on the skin of the woman. And if there's a mark left, a lawsuit can be brought against you. And according to one commentator, um, this, if you use a stick, cannot be bigger than a tooth stick with which you brush your teeth. And that is much smaller in diameter than the thumb, <laughs> and much smaller in length also. Um, again, the question is, when everything has been said and done, you cannot wish these words away. These words remain in the text. So how do you explain that? Is there explanation? Well, let me first cite a couple of explanations that I think uh, do not hold much water, but they have been offered. You might run into them. One is um, uh, some women uh, need to be taught a lesson, and this is the only way you do that. Uh, this might reflect 
uh, the life history of the person himself who presents this opinion, his own experiences, I don't think uh, this really um, holds much water or is acceptable. Another is um, that if they refuse uh, to go to bed with you, then you have the right to force them into subjection. But the question again is, what if the woman has the same uh, desire or wants you to go to bed with her? What do you do? And you refuse. Is she supposed to come and beat you up also? And there are a couple of other views also. Um, now, what's the use of having a nuclear bomb? Uh, not to use it, but as a deterrent. And when I read this verse, something of the kind comes to my mind. I think of the family as a social unit, and for any, and you can correct me on this, it's not that I am presenting it as a definitive view and I want you to accept it. Please critique it also and tell me if there is something wrong with it, just for your consideration. I don't claim I have the last word on it, by the way. Um, for any, from a sociological standpoint, from a sociological standpoint, um, every social unit needs an administrator. And for that administration, to have meaning, uh, some kind of coercive power has to go along with that administration if it is not to become simply advisory. And this is not the case uh, with the family unit. So it's possible that, again from a sociological standpoint, uh, coercive, the idea of coercive power is an is a component of this situation. And for this reason, it is allowed. However, an important thing is, this is not a license for wife uh, battering. And the prophet's uh, precedent, his uh, statements are very, very explicit uh, on it. I think uh, legally, um, it's probably Jackson would uh, uh, tell us about it. If a, w a wedding contract is supposed to take place between two independent parties, and anything can be written into the wedding contract, is that right? Anything? Uh, just about anything? Uh, conditions, yeah, but you're allowed to write conditions. So in this case, if a woman, let's say, uh, wants it written into the contract that I will not be uh, beaten physically. Would that constitute a valid uh, contract? Some point now. Uh -huh. Could that become, uh, if the majority of the population uh, were to entertain that view, yeah, could that be written the, into read that as a uh, implied condition in any marriage contract, yeah. No, I mean, could that be made part of uh, the, law, the law of the land? That's what I'm saying, that they would, they would read that into the contract as an implied... That into the contract. As an implied contract. Just like, for example, if we say, I'll sell you this for 100, they would read that as $100. Mm -hmm. Right. As an implied condition in the contract. So, um, let's say... Um, the parliament or assembly in a, uh, in, in, in a Muslim state could very well say that now on this is the Islamic. Well, um, in, in theory, uh, that position could be defended, but I'm one of those who believes in very, very limited government. So I, I, I think the fight subscribes. But yeah, but it's, it's, it's a defensible. All right. All right. It's also possible that in Arabia at that time, and there are examples of it, uh, these were the few ways in which women could be disciplined. And if uh, other ways become possible, give you an example. The Quran says that for certain offenses, uh, people can be exiled. 
Now, the purpose of exile was to deprive a man from sources of support and isolate him. Uh, some scholars say that today that is not a practical option. You cannot exile a man. Um, that's not possible. But prison serves the same purpose, achieves the same goal, and that is isolation. So in the Arabian society of Muhammad's time, uh, since um, the man was in charge, absolutely, um, Islam did not disrupt that system. And this is typical of Islam. See, as far as slavery is concerned, for example, um, Islam encourages Muslims to free slaves of the two or three types of uh, slavery that, were, that existed in Arabia. Islam categorically forbade uh, two and left only one option open, and that is because of certain circumstances. You cannot raid another tribe and capture slaves. That's not possible. And I think we've learned in earlier sessions that within one, two generations, many slaves achieved a prominent status within Islam. They became scholars, they became generals, and they became statesmen. In fact, uh, the second caliph, Omar, said at one time uh, when he was mortally wounded and he appointed a group of six people and said, uh, you can choose your next khalifa from among this group. He said, if a certain individual, Salim was his name, if he had been alive, I would have nominated him the next caliph, Salim. And Salim had died before that. In other words, um, Islam does not condone slavery, but it, it took some time to phase it out. And this is the Islamic approach uh, to issues in life. Wine drinking, you know that wine is drinking is prohibited in Islam. No liquor in Islam. But this prohibition came a long time after uh, the start of the Quranic revelations. At first, the Quran said, uh, grapes, um, you derive from grapes intoxicants um, and good food. Is that it? Rizqan hasana. Tattakhizuna minhu sakaram wa rizqan hasana. Yeah. So, now you see what happens here is the Quran is not prohibiting wine. It's saying, on the one hand, there's good sustenance you derive from it, that is, as uh, fruit. It's a good thing. On the other hand, saying an intoxicant. Implicitly, however, the Quran is saying that that which is good food is not an intoxicant, and that which is an intoxicant is not good food. Some people, very intelligent people, they said, ah, this is the way the wind will blow. Uh, and so they stopped drinking. Later on, the Quran said, um, when you are drunk, do not uh, perform the prayer. With five prayers in the day, you couldn't afford to be drunk for a very long period of time. So many more people stopped drinking. And finally came the prohibition of wine drinking. The point is that in these matters, what we've called orf, customary law. What Islam does is it takes the existing model, takes the existing model and allows it either to continue if it agrees with Islam in letter and spirit, if it doesn't contain anything that would go against Islam. But if it is not in keeping with, in conformity with Islam, then Islam, instead of saying, oh, tomorrow, um, no more slavery. And you know what happened in the US itself? Emancipation, 1860s, uh, no slavery from tomorrow onward. That did not abolish it completely, or the prohibition in the 1920s. No more drinking from tomorrow onward. That did not work either. 
So what Islam does is take a gradual approach to the solution of problems. So I sometimes think, and this is uh, uh, simply a hypothesis I have. I have uh, no strong grounds for believing it's correct, no clear-cut definitive evidence. But it's possible, it's possible that in this matter also, Islam continued uh, that tradition and imposed some severe restrictions on the use of the authority to begin with that the male person already had in a family. But if you look at the overall Islamic context, once again, an arranged marriage, right or wrong? Uh -uh. The question is wrong. It's the context that really matters. So if you look at the overall Islamic context with the injunctions that we have looked at already and which stipulate very explicitly that uh, women as human beings are human beings and there's no distinction between them and men.